The Lord be with you. Good morning, everyone. Lovely to see you. Lovely to see you, Sylvia, out. Lovely to see everybody out this morning to worship the Lord together on this bank holiday weekend and our morning prayer service of worship. It's really lovely to be sharing this service with uh, Canon Norman Jardine. And Norman will be speaking to us a little bit later as we focus in on the life of Enoch. Let's listen to these words inspired by Psalm 81, which remind us why we're here. This is a paraphrase of some verses from Psalm 81. O God, we gather in your presence to praise your holy name with songs on our lips and hope in our hearts. We gather here because we find joy and love, peace and grace in you. We celebrate our God who provides stability in difficult times. We praise our God who loves us more than we can imagine. So with this in mind, let's stand to sing our opening hymn together. It's hymn 365, Praise to the Lord. Let's stand. We turn to page 101 in our prayer books as we remain standing. Page 37 if you're using the large print. Beloved in Christ, we come together to offer to Almighty God our worship and praise and thanksgiving, to confess our sins and to receive God's forgiveness, to hear His holy word proclaimed, 
to bring before him our needs and the needs of the world, and to pray that in the power of his Spirit we may serve him and know the greatness of his love. So let's sit or kneel to confess our sins to God our Father. Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, by what we have done and by what we have failed to do. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. May Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, may he have mercy on you. May he pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand with me, turning to page 103 in our prayer books, page 39 in the large print. O Lord, open our lips. O God, make speed to save us. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. We remain standing to sing hymn 372, 372, through all the changing scenes of life.
take your seats. And our first Bible reading this morning is taken from Genesis chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. Genesis chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. This is the written account of Adam's family line. When God created mankind, he made them in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them. And he named them mankind when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he had a son in his own likeness, in his own image, and he named him Seth. After Seth was born, Adam lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters. And then dropping down to verse 21, dropping a few generations as well. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. After he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked faithfully with God 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enoch lived a total of 365 years. Enoch walked faithfully with God. Then he was no more because God took him away. This is the word of the Lord. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 81. We return to that psalm we opened our service with, and we're going to speak out verse 1 and then verses 10 to 16, verse 1, and then 10 to 16 of Psalm 81. You'll find it on page 686 of your prayer books, page 404 if you're using the large print version. So we speak out by half verse from Psalm 1, responsibly by half verse, I should say. Sing merrily to God our strength. And then dropping down to verse 10. I am the Lord your God who brought you up from the land of Egypt. But my people would not hear my voice. So I sent them away in the stubbornness of their hearts. Oh, that my people would listen to me. Then I should soon put down their enemies. Those who hate the Lord would be humbled before him. But Israel would I feed with the finest wheat. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our New Testament reading this morning is taken from Hebrews chapter 11, beginning at the first verse. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. This is the word of the Lord. So we want to pray for ourselves and for Norman as he comes to speak to us this morning as we look a wee bit more depth in this biblical character of Enoch. But let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for these heroes of the faith. 
And Lord, we pray that we would learn from the life of Enoch and how he walked with you. Living God who walks with us, we pray that you would show us from Enoch's life how to walk closely with you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things I love about living in this part of East Belfast is that there's so many walks about here. I'm coming through now, I think. I say the same thing. This is, I'm repeating myself. One of the things I love about East Belfast is that there are so many walks about here. I'm a countryman from Banbridge and Heather's from Donnacrony and there's lovely places to walk around there, but you're walking in country roads and there's plenty of traffic and nowadays I think you're taking your life in your hands when you're trying to walk on some of those roads. But there's so much around here to explore that's safe and sound. The likes of Orangefield Park, I live in Orby Drive, the likes of Orangefield Park and Cumber, New, Cumber uh, Walkway. All sorts of places, safe places to walk, good places to walk and enjoy the air and the atmosphere and the, 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 the creation around us. Great picture walking, great picture of the Christian life. It's about a walk with God. The Christian life is actually described as a walk with God. We see that in the Old Testament reading and the New Testament reading, both in fact, that Ross read earlier. We see that about this man called Enoch. Now, Enoch's not a well-known character in many senses. He only appears in the Bible in a couple of places and only briefly about the same incidences in his life, the same truths about his life. But he has some tremendous things to say to us, or God rather, has some powerful things to say to us through the life of Enoch. But Enoch was a man who walked with God. That's the description of him both in Genesis and in Hebrews where the story is told. He's a man who walked with God. That's an outstanding thing in the Bible terms. It's a call to us all, but specifically a particular thing for Enoch. To walk with God means to walk with the Father. To walk with God means to walk with the Son. Jesus called his disciples, come follow me. And he wasn't asking them to get on the bus. He wasn't asking them to get on a boat or a train, though we might do that nowadays for some of us. He was asking them to walk with him. Jesus' whole ministry was about walking through the streets and the highways of Jerusalem and the country roads of Judea and Galilee. And his disciples followed him. They walked with him. Sure, there's times they were weary and tired. But nonetheless, those walks were wonderful times when you read the Gospels. Hearing Jesus speak the words of life. Seeing Jesus do the miracles of God. Great, wonderful things as they walk with God. And in the same sense, we are called today to walk with God. To walk with the Father, to walk with the Son. And to do so in the power of the Holy Spirit. Walk in the Spirit, Galatians chapter 5, is a description of a Christian who sets out to follow Jesus. They go to walk in the Spirit, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, walking with God. And one of the great privileges of being a Christian is to know that God walks with us. And in a sense, to do down all Liverpool supporters, God walks with us so we never walk alone. We never walk alone when we walk with God. There's always a companion and a, and a friend. I walk with God in groups of people. I walk with God with, in terms of family times and things like that. But so often, often I walk solo, but not alone. Solo, because God is also there. And I consciously at times seek to talk to God and communicate with God. And unconsciously at other times just seek to suck up his presence and suck on his influence and see his, you know, the intimacy of walking with God sense of his presence and his direction in our lives it's often communicated to the likes of me anyway it's often communicated through walking with God in the biblical sense walking with God is how this man Enoch is described as if you like the testimony of his life he bore this testimony he walked with God he walked with God Enoch's a man, he's part of the table of the ancients in early Genesis. 
the ancients who begin with Adam and go through to Noah. And Enoch's one of them. And we've already heard from Ross the reading. Enoch walked with God 300 years. Altogether, Enoch lived 365 years. Enoch walked with God, then he was no more because God took him. Enoch's one of these long livers, but by no means the longest. Methuselah is the longest. In 182 years, I think it is, is often the quiz question that. In 182 years, and he's, no, he's Enoch's son. Enoch lived 365 years. Peanuts compared to Methuselah. But it's not about the length of time. It's not about the many years they lived. I don't understand the long years any more than anybody else does. There's mystery to this. I do see some indications as to why basically the age gradually got lower and lower in generations after the ancients until it was 83 score years and 10 from the standard, the, the target. I don't understand the years. And I don't remember all the details of the stories. But I know that these were fruitful years where Enoch walked with God. 365 of them. What that would compare to us today, I don't know. But there's an interesting thing said, and it's only said about Enoch, said in the, interest, in the testimony of Genesis chapter 5. Enoch walked with God, and after he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked with God. After he became the father of Methuselah, for 65 years, Enoch must have walked with God or walked in some particular way in life. But after, after Methuselah was born, something happened. Something so significant happened that the little fact is recorded in Genesis chapter 5. That a change came over Enoch. And Enoch walked with God 300 years after that time. Altogether, Enoch lived 365 years. So it's not just about length here. It's not just about longevity here. This is about something special happening in Enoch's life when Enoch was 60 and Methuselah was born. We don't know what happened. We don't know what connection there was with Methuselah's birth. But something happened significantly enough for the Bible to record the fact that after Methuselah was born, Enoch walked with God in a different way. I don't know what. I uh, would understand that maybe in some senses to be he walked with God in a fuller sense. He came into a whole new encounter with God and began a walk with God then at 60. That went on for the rest of his life. But Enoch walked with God, and that's how he's described. And as he walked with God, he experienced God's presence and God's peace. As he walked with God, we assume he knew God's direction and God's uh, calling in his life. He knew God's love and peace and joy as he walked with God. He knew God's grace. We'll come back to that in a minute or two. Enoch walked with God and he lived well. He lived well through those years. He was someone who pleased God. That's what we're told about him. He was someone who pleased God. What does that mean? Well, pleasing God is an awful lot easier <laughs> than pleasing other people. But because God's a God of grace, and God's a God of embrace, and God's a God of love who reaches out to us, surrounds us. And because Enoch experienced this presence of God, he sought to live in order to please God. Not in any kind of syncophonic way. Not in any kind of yes man kind of the way. Not in any kind of works oriented person. But just somebody who loved God. Loved to be in his presence. And God enjoyed his presence. And God was pleased with, him, with, uh, with, with Enoch. God was pleased with Enoch. Enoch pleased God. What a testimony. How I'd love that on my tombstone. Enoch pleased God. Would it be true, Lord, of me? And would it be true of us all? And as he pleased God and walked with God, he lived by faith. Hebrews picks him up. He's one of the heroes of the faith. And Hebrews tells us that Abraham was one of those who lived by faith. Up to 
I, now faith has been sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients, that's the Abraham generations, the uh, Enoch generations, that the ancients were commended for. And about Enoch, by faith, Enoch could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. Commended. A testimony. He walked with God. Another testimony. He pleased God. He was commended for it. He lived well. He lived fruitfully. He lived richly in terms of God's presence and God's peace. But not out of grace. He lived by faith. And faith means understanding that God exists and that he rewards those who seek him. And God is a God of grace who welcomes them. God, by grace, welcomed Enoch into that walk and into that relationship. It wasn't that Enoch battered the door down. It wasn't that Enoch paid the price of entry. It wasn't that Enoch said to God, I'll do this if you bless me. God reached out to Enoch and Enoch just surrendered his life to God and pleased God from then onwards. He walked with God, he pleased God. And in his life, in his testimony, we're told that in his walk with God, that one particular day, something particular happened and he was no more because God took him. Genesis 5, 23. Altogether, Enoch lived 365 years. Enoch walked with God. Then he was no more because God took him away. Wonderful stuff. God loves, the, God loves mysteries and revealing mysteries unto his children, unto his people. The Holy Spirit's task is to reveal mysteries unto the church. And here's a mystery we not understand in full, but we see enough to think to keep us going. Enoch walked with God, then he was no more because God took him away. Can you imagine just being out watching what was going on? There's Enoch and God walking together. And all of a sudden, just something happens and Enoch's gone. He hasn't died. He's not lying with a body on the floor or in the, uh, on, the, on the roadside. He's not dying. He's not lying in his bed. He's just gone. He's gone. He's not here anymore. And the explanation of the Bible for that is that God took him. God lifted him up from earth into glory. God lifted him up and raised him up from earth into glory. The nearest thing to people witnessing this kind of thing, and it only happens twice in the Old Testament, it only happens twice in the Bible, is Enoch and Elijah. Both were caught up by God into, heaven, into the air. Both were caught from earth into heaven without dying. Without dying. Enoch walked with God and just walked into glory. Elijah, he went on a chariot of fire. Both of them, if you went to search for their body, you'd search for eternity and not find them because God had taken them up. God had captured them, kept, 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 uh, just caught them in, in, into his presence. Enoch walked with God, God took him. God raised him up. We are not likely, I think, to be caught that way, to be caught up into God's presence. We will be like the rest of the ancients, those chapters in early Genesis. Men who lived long lives, they're all men, he mentioned the ancients then, they all lived long lives to Methuselah's 982 years record. But after every single one of them, if you read through Genesis chapter 5, after every single one of them, it says, then he died. After Jared lived 962 years, then he died. And Methuselah had lived 969 years, and then he died. Even Noah, a man who also captured, was captured by God's grace, and we have a whole story about Noah and it was one of the, the last of the ancients, if you like. Even though Noah, at the end of his life, it says, then he died. Then he died, then he died, then he died. Enoch walked with God and he was not because God took him. 
different man, different testimony, different reason. He pleased God. He walked with God. He was captured by God. What about us? Well, we can call, we're called to certainly experience two parts of Abraham's, of Enoch's testimony. We can be like him as someone who walks with God. By grace, we don't have to do something special. We don't have to twist God's arm. We don't have to bribe God. We don't have to do anything like that. We have just to respond to God's grace and let the outcome be in God's hands. To try and live to please God is a, an impossible task if we do it in our own flesh, in our own strength, in our own, uh, our own abilities. It's an impossible task. Totally, utterly impossible. It wasn't that, Abraham, that Enoch passed the tests, got his exams. It was that Abraham, uh, it was that Enoch walked with God and God took him home. We don't know why, we don't know how, but that's just the reality of it. That's the way the cookie crumbles, if you read Genesis chapter 5. That's the reality and the truth. We just accept it and wonder at it and are inspired by it. Not that we think we'll repeat it, but we're inspired by it that that's what God can do. And the God who can do that is the God who, through Jesus, is going to come back to earth and take his people home, if you like, Enoch. Take them home to the same place that Enoch went to, not by the same means and the same method. But God has a plan and a purpose. A plan and a purpose for the church throughout the ages, through the Old Testament and the New, that, that God's church. And First Thessalonians chapter 5 tells us an insight we need to bear in mind here. Chapter 4 tells us an insight we need to bear in mind here. That a time is coming. The next time came way back then. But a time is coming when Jesus is going to come back again. When Jesus is going to return again. And that time is about to dawn. Sometime or other it'll dawn. And in a sense at that particular time, this whole business of being caught up in the, caught up to heaven by God's presence, caught up in the heaven into the skies, caught up to heaven and the glory of Jesus. That particular moment the church names it the rapture. We wait for, we await the rapture. We await the day when Jesus returns. But listen to these words from 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. According to the Lord's own word, chapter, chapter 5, according, chapter 4, sorry. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, in other words, those who are still living on earth, those who are still alive, who are left to the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. It's not that those who are living on earth then when Jesus returns will get to heaven first. That's certainly not going to be the case. Not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So there's no privilege for those who are still alive when Jesus returns. But after that, and in the midst of that moment, that particular instant in time and history, after that, we who are still alive, that's all who are still alive when Jesus returns. And that may include you and me. As the day draws nearer, it may include you and me, who are still alive when the Lord returns. We will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. If we are still alive when Jesus returns, and some of us are going to be, whether of this generation or the next or the next, some of us humans are going to be alive in the earth when Jesus returns. And when he returns, and he comes with the archangel, with the glory of God, with all the saints in heaven, as the dead in Christ are raised all around us, then we are raptured if we're still around. If we're, if we're still alive. If we're raptured, we're caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. 
and so you'll never be with the Lord. That's part of our hope. That's part of our future if we belong to Jesus. That's part of tomorrow that needs to impact how we live today because the day is coming. We never know when or how, but we will know soon and we will know surely. And if we're still alive on earth, we surely will be raptured, caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Instant transformation, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This flesh transformed into heavenly bodies to be part of it all. And Jesus tells us to be ready for that day, to be ready for that moment, the moment of rapture, to be ready for it. When he's talking about the second coming, Jesus tells two little, little stories, if you like, to awaken people. This is how it'll be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. It'll be as instant as that. As sudden as that. Two men going about their daily business. Jesus is coming. The trumpets sound. One of them's caught up to meet the Lord in the air. The other's left behind. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken. The other left behind. Same picture, different characters. That's at the moment Jesus returns. God has done it with Enoch. God did it with Elijah. God's going to do it with the church, the living church, the believing church. When Jesus comes back again. Are you ready for that time? Because when Enoch set out for a walk one particular day, we don't know what plans he had for the rest of the day. We don't know what plans he had for the next week or the next month or the next years. But God has other plans for him. Enoch, come home with me. Enoch, come home. You didn't go back to your house. You didn't come back to my, those around the family. They'll look after themselves. Enoch, you come home with me today. And his life was transformed forever. You and I need to know the truth about salvation. We need to know how to live well. And living well is knowing Jesus. Living well is living by faith, not by works. Living well is seeking by grace and strength in the Holy Spirit to please the Father. Living well leads to dying well. Not that Enoch or Elijah read it, died a glorious death. They just didn't die. They just went to glory. What a joy. What an anticipation we should have of that for ourselves. But don't hang about waiting. Don't hang about waiting. Read that bit in Matthew 24. Be alert, be ready, but be working and serving because the day can come at any hour. Let's pray. Lord, may we believe your truth by the Spirit's witness to our hearts. May we hold on to your truth. May we walk with you forever. And Lord, may we be ready for the return of Jesus and anticipate the rapture to heavenly glory. In Jesus' name. Thanks, Norman. May our life be like Enoch. May we place all our hope on God like Enoch did. And we're going to sing of that in our next hymn, hymn number 10. All my hope on God is founded. He doth still my trust renew. Let's stand and sing hymn number 10 together.
remain standing and turn in our books of common prayer to page 112, 112, page 48, if you're using the large print. And together we declare our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us sit or kneel to pray. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord. O Lord, save the Queen. Let your ministers be clothed with righteousness. O Lord, save your people. Give peace in our time, O Lord. O God, may clean our hearts within us. A collect for today. O God, you declare your almighty power most chiefly in showing mercy and pity. Mercifully grant to us such a measure of your grace that we, running the way of your commandments, may receive your gracious promises and be made partakers of your heavenly treasure. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Will you join with me, please, in the third collect at morning? Go before us. In all our doings, with your most gracious favor, and further us with your continual help, that in all our works, con continued and ended in you, we may glorify your holy name, and finally, by your mercy, attain everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So in our intercessions this morning, I'm going to introduce various areas for our prayers, and then I'll leave space for us to uh, privately pray, pray along that theme. Let's pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, you promised through your Son, Jesus Christ, to hear the prayers of those who ask in faith. Lord of your people, Strengthen your church in all the world. Renew the life of this diocese of Down and Dromore. Bless David, our bishop, and build us all up in faith and love. We pray especially for the Bible week this week across the diocese, that it will bring renewed faith and vision to all. Lord of creation, look with favor on the world you have made. Guide the nations in the ways of justice and peace. And bless Elizabeth, our queen, and all in authority. We pray particularly this morning for those caught up in the awful flooding in Pakistan. Lord, would you bring relief and aid. Lord, would you use your church there to bring your compassion. And we continue to pray in this country for the election of a new prime minister. 
Lord, may your will be done. Lord, of our relationships, comfort and sustain the communities in which we live and work. Help us to love our neighbors as ourselves. Enable us to serve our families and friends and to love one another as you love us. This morning, we particularly think of our local schools and we pray for our children, for our young people, for our teachers, for the assistants, and for the many others involved in school life as this new school year begins again. Lord of all healing, relieve and protect those who are sick or suffering. Be with those who have any special need. Lord, bring your comfort and your peace. And we remember especially this morning the family of Peter Wellstead, who passed away unexpectedly this weekend. Lord, be with them. I pray that they would reach out and know the embrace of your love. We pray that you would deliver all who know danger, violence, or oppression. And Lord of eternity, would you bind us together by your Holy Spirit in communion with all who, having professed the faith, have died in the peace of Christ, that we may entrust ourselves and one another and our whole life to you, Lord God, and come with all your saints to the joys of your eternal kingdom. Amen. stand to sing our closing hymn. It's hymn 553, 553, Jesus, lover of my soul. Let's sing as we stand.
Let's take our seats. What a beautiful hymn. Before we close in prayer, just a few notices to share with you. Um, this week, there's no prayer club on Tuesday night, and that's because Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday at Willowfield Church, there is a diocesan Bible week. So that's at 7.45 each night. There'll be good worship and good teaching, and it's good to meet with other Christians from across the diocese. So that's Tuesday to Friday, 7.45 at Willowfield. Be good to go along to at least one of those evenings. Um, next Sunday night, we're trying a new initiative called Story and Song. Uh, it's going to be a block of worship, um, a Bible reading. Then we're going to hear from someone, just some of their faith story. So it's not a preach. Uh, it's, we've got other times for that. It's just to hear somebody's faith story, what, uh, how God has impacted their life in a particular way or more generally across their life. So that's eight o'clock in the church next Sunday night. Why not come along and try it? It's always good to gather. In the middle of September, on Wednesday, September the 14th, we're beginning a Bible study on the book of James. So that's in the rectory. It's not hybrid. It's just in flesh. Four weeks, probably beginning Wednesday, September the 14th, 8 p.m. in the rectory. Now, our friend Andy Moore is being instituted in St. Patrick's Ballymena on Wednesday, September the 21st at 7.30. Sonia and I will be going. We'd love if a whole clatter of us went up to encourage him. If anybody wants to go with us, we have three spaces in the car, so you can come with us. But it'd be good if a group of us went to encourage Andy as he's instituted curate uh, at St. Patrick's Ballymena. Two other we notices our church reopening Thanksgiving service for our refurbishment is going to be held on September the 25th at 11 a.m. And following that, there'll be refreshments in the hall, a light lunch in the hall. So please do put that in your diary and let's plan to come along and really give thanks to God for what he has enabled us to do in terms of updating our uh, church. And last but not least, um, we're looking for some help. We're looking for some people to help us with our children and youth ministry. Maybe you're thinking, that's not something I can do. But actually, it's really of value if somebody from a couple of generations removed, maybe from our children and young people, are involved in the work. So if you were able to give your time once a month or even once a term and come alongside our children and young people in one of the many different programs that operate here, we would really uh, appreciate that, and so would the children and young people. So if that's something you're thinking, I could explore that, I don't want to commit, but I could explore that, then talk to Sonia and myself in Jane's absence, and we can connect you with her. But uh, it would be lovely if some of you were able to help in this way. I know some of you do in different ways, but it would be lovely if some more of you were able to help in this way. Let's stand together for our closing prayer before we head. Let's pray. Living God, who calls us to follow, would you enlarge our vision of you? May your Spirit guide and strengthen us. May you send us out in mission and service to your world to live and work to your praise and glory. And may the blessing of our God of life, the Christ of love, and the spirit of grace be upon us this day and forevermore. Amen. Lovely to see you. God bless you and see you soon.